Mike Sempervivi here with you for the next hour talking professional wrestling and mixed martial arts, something we do every single day here on the Sports Byline Broadcasting Network. Tune in, iHeart, American Forces Radio, SportsByline.com, over-the-air affiliates like the Mightier 1090, Sirius XM 156 via podcast or video streaming on Twitch and YouTube. However you're joining me today, I'd just like to say thank you. I am currently joining you via two tin cans strung together. They are chunky soup cans, all cleaned out. One was, uh, was, was cream of mushroom. The other one was clam chowder. That's what it feels like we're in right now as we've started the show with technical difficulties. There's always got to be something. But you know what? It does remind me of the times where we first started this show, where we would do it on the phone, and it was painful. And I hope we can get the things fixed that we need to get fixed so we can actually get through and do this show in a normal fashion because we got a lot to get into today. There's, there's of course, AEW Dynamite tonight, Blood and Guts. As is a part of my contract here, we will review NXT 2.0 on the USA Network last night. Yesterday, Brian said, in the last couple of weeks, the show has been better. And that may have been because it was taped. You know what? I tend to agree with them. Either I have gotten more used to things or they figured things out a little bit better. But you know what? I think the show has gotten better. Doesn't mean there wasn't some bad stuff on there. Doesn't mean there wasn't some juxtaposed stuff on there. But this show wasn't that bad. I'm not sure how much I'm looking forward to the Great American Bash coming up next week, but we'll see. Once again, a lot of stuff to get into here today. There's day baseball going on as well, too. It's a, it's a busy day in this world. R. Kelly's getting getting sentenced, and there's more injuries because that's what we have to have in wrestling right now, more injuries to talented people like Nathan Frazier. And I'll get into that as well as everything else when we get back from break, Wrestling Observer Live. Let's try this again. Let's get it. Mike Sempervivi here with you for the next hour, talking professional wrestling and mixed martial arts, something we do every single day here on the Sports Byline Broadcasting Network. And however you're joining me today, whether it be through TuneIn, iHeart, American Forces Radio, SportsByline.com, over-the-air affiliates like the Mightier 1090, Sirius XM 156 via podcast or video streaming on Twitch or YouTube, I'd just like to say thank you. Thank you very much if you held on through that first portion where we went back to the two tin can method that we used to use way back in the day, but crisis averted. You should have seen and heard what we were going through in that last break that felt like we went on for 10 minutes, but somehow, some way, 20 seconds before we returned, we got everything fixed. So I'd like to thank video producer John. I'd like to thank audio producer uh, the the famous Dom, and uh, no thank you to Brian Alvarez, because we're going to blame his system as the reason that all of this stuff happened, because that's what it seems to be. But you know what it is. Uh, if you want to yell at me about today, you can, at Semper Vivi on Twitter. The timeline for this show is at F4, or W-O-N-F4-W. The broadcaster is at Sports Byline USA, and if you love pro wrestling, at Mid-Atlantic Pod. So... Now that everything is settled down again, let is, let's get into the news of the day, and there is a lot of it, as there always is. There's the NXT 2.0 review from last night that I will be doing a little bit later on, and of course, AEW Blood and Guts tonight. But Blood and Guts will be taking place with one less regular member of the roster as up on the main page at WrestlingObserver.com, it is noted that the Dark Order's Alan Angels, a.k.a. Five's contract, expired. Uh, Brian Alvarez confirmed that his contract did expire. However, he is expected to work in AEW on a per-date deal. On Monday night, Angels tweeted he's excited for what's next. Stu Grayson, an early AEW roster member and original Dark Order member, cannot come to terms on a new deal earlier on this year and also left. It is unknown if there were any such negotiations with Angels on a contract. The 24 four-year-old debut during the early pandemic era Norcross Georgia TV tapings in 2020, which feel like 
Talk about something that feels like 10 years ago now. That was definitely it. Had a match with Kenny Omega that got everybody all fired up because of the amount of offense that Omega gave to Angels. They then uh, replayed it up, but not all that long ago before uh, Omega got injured uh, and was out for a while. They, They went back and teased that again, but... He hasn't been used on TV since a pure rules bout against Daniel Garcia uh, at the uh, the Universal Studios TV tapings that have already are already in the can and are still waiting to get rolled out there. So he made his New Japan Strong debut not all that long ago. So that looks like it could be a good landing spot for him. And you never know with Ring of Honor taking place, we have no idea what form that is going to take. But there are a lot of opportunities out there, including in places like Beyond and other places like that for Alan Angel. So best of luck to him. Best of luck to everybody in pro wrestling right now who is not injured. And and best of uh, wishes for recovery for everybody that is. We can add another name to the list. Nathan Frazier is now injured. The British wrestler revealed that news on Tuesday. The nature of his injury and how long he'll be out is unknown right now. Says he's dealing with a little injury. That's, at least that's what he put on Twitter. But he also said, I'll be back before you know it. Frazier hasn't wrestled since a June 10th NXT house show from Tampa, Florida. He was defeated by Carmelo Hayes in a North American title match that night. I like uh, Ian Carey here, who put the uh, story on the front page of the website. He's got all the stats going on here. Frazier recently moved from NXT from NXT to NXT from NXT UK after losing a title match to Ilya Dragunov on March 3rd. Since moving to the brand, his record is 2-2 two and two with one no contest, including that house show loss to Hayes. He actually has a pretty good list. When you look at the guys he's wrestled, they've all been, you know, as far as NXT goes, like solid people. Defeated Grayson Waller and his NXT debut at Spring Breakin', then went to a no contest with Wes Lee. After that, he lost a match to Cameron Grimes and then defeated Santos Escobar. So Nathan Frazier, the best of luck to him. Hopefully this is just a minor injury and he can get back at full strength because he is really fun to watch. His future in, in WWE in the long term, yeah. who knows how that'll go. You look at other guys on the roster who are kind of like him and you see the positions they're in, and you don't feel good about it. But as far as him being an NXT goes and some of the people that he can mix it up with, I'm, I'm good with it. They don't need him on Raw right now, though. Well, they need stars on Raw. They don't necessarily need him. But this past Monday, all they needed was John Cena. They did a ridiculous number on Monday night, and I'm sure you, you've already heard about this by now. It seems to be splattered everywhere because of the demographic numbers that the show did, but Raw, second straight huge number, an episode built around John Cena's 20th anniversary, best 18-34 to 34 numbers in recent memory. The episode averaged 1.95 million viewers overall, a rating in the 18 to 49 demo and a 0.40 in 18 to 34. What do those numbers mean? Well, overall, the show was actually down 2% from last week, which had the Vince McMahon publicity, and it was actually down 1% in the 18 to 49s. But it was the number one show on TV in that demographic. And was up 18% in people 18 to 34, which is because of John Cena. It's doesn't you know, not a lot of rocket science here. You know, if you were a kid between the ages of 18 to 14 when Cena dropped and started becoming a star, no surprise that if maybe you drifted away from wrestling or not or not as big of a fan as you once were to hear John Cena was coming back, big match John, you wanted to see what he was going to do. And... That's what happened. There was no sports taking place other than your personal big three basketball games and cornhole tournaments and and beer league softball and all that. So none of that to get in the way. So Raw once again did a hell of a number, did more than triple anything else on cable TV in the 18 to 34 year olds and triple everything in men 12 to 34. Raw won every key demo on cable 
and beat every network show in 18 to 49s with a celebrity family feud episode on ABC doing a point five zero, and is, uh, I believe it was Dave or whoever wrote this on the front page of the website. That's with a huge advantage in the audience pool that they have to pull from. In 18 to 34s, Raw was the second largest number on all of television behind only Mi Fortuna S. Marte. Hopefully I did that some justice on Univision. That did a point four. Or two just huge number one original show on cable ninth overall after the eight cable news shows did more than double the closest competition in 18 to 49 overall so just crazy post wrestling reported today that in canada the show did about 185,000 viewers uh, about 93,000 in the 25 to 54 demo was the third Biggest sports show in Canada behind a Toronto-Boston game and an early edition of Sportsnet Central. Uh, You know, the Observer Front Page article about this also noted that Raw was helped by no below deck. It's biggest competition on cable now that sports is gone. And believe it or not, I get a little bit more on that in a moment. But Raw's three hours, 8 p.m., 2.01 million. The second hour, 2.02 million. And the third hour, 1.83. How strong was the show? The show was so strong, Ms. and Mrs., after it was over with, did 669,000 people, which was up 14% from last week, the, the highest that show has done since May of 2021, and it ended up ranking number six in people 18 to 49 amongst cable originals. It was crazy. What's also crazy is the amount of you people out there watching Below Deck, because not only is sports going to be a problem in the fall, apparently they have added a third Below Deck show, Below Deck Adventure. The new series follows charter guests in the glacial fjords of Norway. Will they were get will they were get into such thrilling activities as dog sledding, hella skiing, cold water plunging, and fishing in the Scandinavian waters? The mega yacht crew will be pushed like we've never seen before on Below Deck as they cater to ultra-wealthy clients on top of dealing with the physical demands of cold water adventures. I'm going to throw some cold water on myself, breathe a little bit, and get back. Wrestling Observer Live. Back on the show, Mike Sempervivi here with you. Wrestling Observer Live. Shout out to everybody that's driving around right now, truckers who listen to the show and people listen to it on podcasts, working overnight, and driving about, a bunch of day baseball today, got my Nationals jersey on, Juan Soto, nothing worse than the national media driving Juan Soto out of town, trying to figure out where he's going to go. Maybe he actually signs in Washington, like that would be nice, okay? Maybe that's going to be the case. Everybody wants him, you're not going to get him. Like Darren Judge, same way. He's going to be a Yankee. Deal with that. I'm trying to convince myself of this, but enough of that. Tonight, AEW, Dynamite, TBS, Blood and Guts, Little Caesars Arena in Detroit. Two matches were announced Tuesday on social media. Both challenges made by heel management slash representation. First, Dan Lambert challenged Orange Cassidy on behalf of Ethan Page. Also, Stokely Hathaway tweeted out that he wanted an an open challenge or had an open challenge for Jade Cargill's TBS championship, which Tony Khan ended up responding to and eventually put Layla Gray in the match. Cargill is still riding her undefeated streak at 33-0. Tony Khan also apparently accepted Dan Lambert's challenge on behalf of Orange Cassidy and made the match. Uh, Gray is uh, the current OVW women's champion and actually earlier this year appeared on SmackDown. It may may have been the debut of uh, Raquel Gonzalez up there as Raquel Rodriguez. She also appeared on an episode of Rampage in March where she lost a five-minute rookie challenge to Serena Deeb. So look at her working both sides there trying to get signed. Also announced for tonight... Another Christian Cage promo a week after lighting up Jungle Boy and talking Luchasaurus out of killing him. I know a lot of people were a little down on that promo because of the whole line about, you know, but your father's dead. Honestly, the way he was being built up, it kind of felt like he was telegraphing it the whole time. And 
it was the the big batch of icing on that cake of him being a complete scumbag and turning. And I thought his promo was great. I thought with or without that line, I thought it was fantastic. So I'm not sure what he's going to have on his plate today, but I would wonder if since we saw Luchasaurus last week, if we don't see Jungle Boy this week trying to respond to whatever Christian has to say. That's pretty much all they've announced so far. So, you know, last year before Blood and Guts, there was the whole deal with Cody and QT Marshall that was on that same show. We don't have something of that magnitude yet. Maybe by the time this show is over today, uh, maybe we'll actually have another match added. We'll have to see. But Jericho Appreciation Society... Chris Jericho, Sammy Guevara, Jake Hager, Daniel Garcia, Matt Menard, and Angelo Parker against the Blackpool Combat Club, John Moxley, Wheeler Yuta, Claudio Castagnoli, Eddie Kingston, Santana, and Ortiz. Last year's Blood and Guts, of course, MJF's Pinnacle Group, Chris Jericho's Inner Circle, did a great number for him, over a million people watched. The end, Tully Blanchard steals the key which allowed MJF to get out of the cage. He climbs up to the top. Chris Jericho goes after him. And, of course, that led to the infamous finish of MJF threatening to throw Jericho off the top. So Sammy Guevara surrenders for his team. And, of course, MJF throws him off anyway. Everything's fine except for the camera angle where Jericho lands in what looked like a crash pad and cardboard because it was a crash pad and cardboard. And that's okay when somebody is falling off the top of a cage on a pro wrestling show on national TV. You do need those sorts of things. But the camera angle was not their friend. The production was not their friend on that one. And that was, of course, coming after the whole deal with Eddie Kingston and John Moxley and the exploding death match, which once again didn't go off because of production as planned. We'll see how they make it up this time around. One thing is for sure, we are going to see blood. Will we see guts? Probably not. The closest we've seen to real guts pouring out was when Cash Wheeler ripped his arm open on the ring post, and that is as close as I ever want to see to to guts coming out on national TV. But a ton of blood, surely, for this. There are storylines that are surely going to come out of this, not the least of which is going to be Claudio and Eddie Kingston. Eddie Kingston has been doing a lot of talking on Twitter, bringing up and and acknowledging people that have brought up his feuds with Claudio in the past. Their relationship is as sour as it is, and Eddie not trusting him. You know, they are obviously leaning heavy on this. Is there a chance they go with the... WCW approach and have do the Kurt Henning thing with the horsemen and have Claudio turn on the Blackpool Combat Club and that gives Jericho the victory you could absolutely do that I absolutely don't think that would be a good idea since I really want to see Claudio remain uh, with the Blackpool Combat Club because for me one of the reasons why is having that extra body there once again, take some of the pressure off Brian Danielson. And if you have somebody else in there representing that group who can team with Moxley, who can be involved in stuff, who can be a mentor to Yuta and play in the storylines, I think it's perfect. And I, I, and I hope they don't go in that sort of wacky direction, but I'm not sure who's going to get the victory. And I'm not sure how. Uh, John Moxley uh, being the the heavyweight champion, you know, him making a Angelo Parker submit uh, and scream for his life or something like that. I think that would be the way I would end this. I'm not sure if they're going to want to continue on anything with Jericho in this group. You know, Jericho can easily win or have an issue where he ends up getting the victory and standing tall, and that's how he challenges John Moxley down the line. It, it's going to be interesting here because, uh, again, there are, there's a lot of six-on-six. Six. I don't think we've ever seen a War Games-type match in any promotion that's to this size. But we'll have to see. I, I guess if I had a, a gun held to my head and had to pick, I think I'll go with the Jericho Appreciation Society. I would love to see the baby faces stand tall here and get the victory and and have something come from there. But... Jericho getting the victory here, again, to lead to something with John Moxley. 
I can see that happening. So that's coming up tonight. If any other matches are, are announced, we'll go ahead and let you know about those. Let you know about the fact that Dana Brooke, you can add her to the injury list as well as she's recovering from a, quote, bad car accident this past week. On Twitter Tuesday, Dana Brooke revealed that she missed Monday's episode of Raw due to getting into a car accident last week. She wrote that she's doing good and will be back in no time. Much love to the WWE Universe for the support and love standing up for me. The reason I was not on Raw last night was because I got into a bad car accident in the past week. So best of luck to her as I was kind of delaying right there as I wanted to see the the guy with the oversized lawnmower for like an eighth of an acre of grass to, to blow through a huge Husqvarna thing. Like the, the patch of grass is this big he's got to cut, yet he's out there. This is truly the land of the Briscoes. Uh, NXT 2.0 report. I'll have the co- that coming up here in the uh, in the final segment. Things coming together for next week in Great American Bash, which, to be honest with you, I didn't even realize was taking place. I'm sure they've been hyping it up on the last couple of shows, but I, with with Money in the Bank going on, with Forbidden Door taking place, with so much stuff happening. Uh, you know, I just I completely missed it. But we did get the debut of Giovanni Vinci, the former Fabian Eichner. And one thing I got to say is he looks like a star. And I was really disappointed when they decided to break Imperium up and they decided to go ahead and have changed Marcel Bartel's name and make him basically a mouthpiece for Walter and somebody who can probably take a couple of bumps for him when you need him to, but not being in the ring and not teaming up, uh, I, I, I just, it, it killed me because I just kept thinking you could bring Walter up to the main roster, you know, as long as you kind of keep him away from Roman Reigns, you keep him away from Brock and build him up. You know, to have Imperium with him, I thought was a great idea. He could basically be, you know, his Usos. And with the lack of tag teams that they have there, as great as Otis and Chad Gable are, I really thought that Imperium could come up to the main roster and actually be behind the Usos, obviously, because no one's going to to replace them. I really thought they could be that second heel team that, of course— like everybody, you know, will lose handicap matches like American Alpha did or like, uh, you know, Chad Gable and and Otis did to Bobby Lashley, but they would still be in good positions and they'd still be able to have great matches. That's not the, the route they decided to take. They decided to break them up. And I was kind of worried with this whole deal with Giovanni Vinci. Uh, what do we got going on here? Because the guy is super talented, but... From first look last night, they've actually invested in the ring entrance. They gave him a cool looking logo. They have, he looks fantastic. So we'll see what happens. They quickly defeated Ikaminjiro, and that was that. But I thought he actually looked really impressive last night. I also was thinking, too, and I've always thought this, I I didn't realize that Vic Joseph and uh, Mackenzie Mitchell were a couple because I always would think with Sarah Schreiber up on the main roster, and no offense to Sarah Schreiber fans, but it's like Mackenzie Mitchell, I think, would do a far better job and kind of fits the role a lot better up on the main roster. Apparently her and Vic Joseph are together, and I'll say this, that team and Wade Barrett... At some point, they'll be up on the main roster all together, and Vince will be yelling in their ears. But for right now, I really enjoy them. I'll talk about the rest of NXT 2.0 when we get back. Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Sempervivi back on the show, Wrestling Observer Live. For those of you listening on the radio, you may have heard a commercial for Herbal Virility Max. The show could use some of that today. I believe all of the rednecks have cleared out of the neighborhood now. I'm cutting grass, so hopefully I can have some peace here in this last segment. I haven't had any peace all day. Didn't get any peace last night watching this show, NXT 2.0. But as I mentioned, there are far worse things in life than having to watch NXT 2.0. There's no way I would review this show in depth, in detail, on multiple shows every week like Brian does. That's for damn sure. But... There are far worse things. And luckily, one of the bad things on the show, they got out of the way early. And that is 
Caden Carter and Katana Chance against Roxanne Perez and Cora Jade. And winners of the match get a shot against Toxic Attraction for the NXT Tag Titles next week at Great American Bash. And boy, they kept cutting back to Toxic Attraction sitting there watching the match in their little catbird seats and their... I don't know if they're catbird seats with a full sofa and all that stuff there, but just sitting there watching the match and a lot of it, especially early on, it was like choreography in slow motion and a lot of telegraphing the rehearsed moves. And I'm not blaming the, the talent. They're, they're doing what they want them to do. And it did get better as it went on. It flowed smoother as it went on, but it was a little bit of a struggle there uh, to start. The finish saw Roxy hit the hot rocks, the sunset bomb out of the corner on Katana for the victory. This toxic attraction made a bunch of sour faces. At 18, 19, however many years old Roxy and Perez is, she was by far the best thing in this match. And I, it's not even close, and it's amazing. Her, Nick Wayne, there's a handful of, of people who are very young. And look, in, in a perfect world, I wouldn't think you get into the wrestling business until you're 21. Certainly not until you're 18. But there are times when you see the, the Nick Waynes and you see the Roxy's where she was a couple years ago at such a young age, being so good, it's amazing. And if she can hold her body together and they can give her something to work with there, they have a future star in their hands. Spoke too soon on the Rednecks outside with the uh, Husqvarna's and all that sort of stuff. That they're back out there again. Uh, speaking of Rednecks, Joe Gacy. I don't know if he is or not, but he kind of looks like one sometimes. He and his dyad group rolled up on the Creeds and Ivy Niles while they were training. Said if Roderick Strong doesn't appreciate them, he does. Julius Creed tells him that they ain't sipping no Kool-Aid and that Diamond Mine is forever. That fires up Roderick Strong, who came walking in with Damon Kemp. Gacy said he wanted to see them prove that they were a family, so they made a match for tonight. Then it was time for Giovanni Vinci to make his debut, and as I said, the newly repackaged Fabian Eichner looks like a star. Again, all the aesthetics, the the, the Gucci-looking gear, you know, the, the walk to the ring that... As he comes down, he'll stand and he'll pose. And then there's the sound of a camera and the, the flash goes off. The screen freezes and it says Venny. And then it says Vidi. And then, of course, the third time it says Vinci. But then when he gets in the ring, and I'm thinking, this is really looking good. He looks fantastic. Cool entrance, all that sort of stuff. They put his name up. Giovanni Vinci. When we get back from break, it was like, damn it, <laughs> figures. But you know what? That's something that WWE talent needs to learn. They need the ability to sit in the corner of a ring in the dark for minutes on end and or to vamp in front of a live crowd. And you have to learn that because they went to commercial, they got back from break, and then Mackenzie Mitchell standing there talking to Toxic Attraction. We had to get their thoughts before this match could take place. JC and Gigi talk about Roxy and Cora. And then <laughs> Mandy starts by saying, and I quote, And Little Miss Breakout Star should have used her contract for the tag team title match in the first place. But even if she thinks of saving that contract for me, oh, no, no. And that's when Nikita Lyons walked in. Yep. Nikita Lyons is back. She walks in, says her eyes are on Mandy, said if, uh, if if she was still in that tournament, Roxanne would have never won it anyway. There was a whole lot more bad dialogue before we finally got back to the ring where Ikemenjiro, of course, then had to be introduced. So a little over six minutes from the time they went to break, finally the match begins. I know on the main roster, 12, 13, 14 minutes sometimes I think we've seen. So it's just something that you got to learn. Thankfully, Vinci dominated the match, got Ikaminjiro out of there pretty quick. There was a really sweet-looking springboard tornado DDT that Jiro sold like a million bucks that Vinci pulled off. It was fantastic. Last ride, powerbomb, got the victory, and that was that. And then... <laughs> 
Pretty good segment here uh, with a bunch of goofy guys, all of which are going to be on the main roster one day. I would be shocked if they're not. Carmelo Hayes and Trick Williams were having an interview with McKenzie that got interrupted by Grayson Waller, who asked him to sign some merch for him. He had his basketball there. He had a bunch of pictures. He talked about his family, wanted to send them home to him. And, of course, Mello... He does it without paying attention to everything that he's going to sign. And Waller's just talking his ear off. So, of course, you know, you got him you got him there just, just mellow, just signing stuff and doesn't really know what he signed, just putting his name on stuff as, as Waller keeps talking to him. And then he said, oh, thanks. And he grabs all of his stuff and he, he goes and runs away. And, of course, Trick points out how, how nice that Grayson Waller is and how trustworthy he thinks he is. So you, you probably already know where that one's going. Then it was time for the new NXT UK Tag Team Champions, Josh Briggs and Brooks Virgin, along with Fallon Henley, came into the ring. They thanked each other and went to go drink beer when Pretty Deadly came out and interrupted them. Apparently, Briggs and Jensen are big Alabama Crimson Tide football fans, which isn't really a baby face thing to do when you're so close to the University of Florida, but... Long story short, there was a bunch of bad dialogue here until the baby faces went on the attack and sent the bricks packing. So surely that there's your, your next tag team title match for NXT UK. And with guys going back and forth anyway, I I understand why you need to have the UK titles and everything, but uh, I, I, I do wonder, you know, the heritage title and, and things like that, the North American title, just mix them back up together please and utilize talent from both sides and just uh, story for another day tiana james is the story for right now as she defeated indy hartwell <laughs> indy hartwell missed a springboard elbow out of the corner by so much towards the finish that james actually had to drag her back towards the corner for the planned finish which was she's going to pin indy with her feet on the ropes except she didn't pull her over enough. So she's stretching back with her foot and she actually gets it and it's pushing against the rope. So I guess we'll count it. <laughs> the referee counted the pin. Indy looked all sorts of upset and disheartened. Kiana kept saying over and over again how much smarter she was than Indy. So I have a feeling this feud will continue. Last three weeks of the show have been taped. We know the two dimes. I, w I was going to try to make a joke there. I won't make any jokes. He, uh, he had a wellness policy violation and probably uh, the, the frustrating enough time and embarrassing enough time for him. I'm not going to pour on him anything. Uh, that was for Tony D'Angelo and Stax to do as we got to that portion of the proceedings where they write off two dimes. They show him out there standing on a bridge, staring down at the water, and D'Angelo's holding what we're led to believe is the watch and jacket of two dimes they never mentioned his name of course but d'angelo says that he he can't believe that guy made a, a move for his chair and that probably now he sleeps with the fishes and he takes the watch and he throws it in the water i don't know why he didn't take the jacket and throw that in the water too but he he takes that with him and as they start to walk away he gets a call from someone asking for the north american champion and he he had a a Spanish accent, probably with Santos Escobar. At least that's what we're led to believe. This makes Tony D'Angelo so upset, he throws his own phone in the water before walking away saying that he's sick of that guy. So we'll see. Obviously, things not going too well with the family. We'll see how things uh, come together here after or during uh, Great American Bash next week. I'm sure without anything announced for those guys, I mean, uh, I cannot believe that they're not going to be a, a main part of it, at least in skits or something like that. We then got a pre-tape Wes Lee promo about facing Trick Williams at the Bash, and then Joe Gacy and the Dyad defeated Roderick Strong and the Creed Brothers. This continued to go into the dissension story 
storyline with Diamond Mind. Julius Wade laid out one of the Dyad brothers with the Cartwheel Suplex and went for the kill when Strong tagged himself in. As the two argue, Brutus saved Strong from getting hit from behind by Gacy. Of course, that caused Strong to start yelling at Brutus. As all this is going on, the Dyad members actually did the old switcheroo and then did a blind tag anyway. <laughs> Gave Strong a double-team spike DDT and got the pin later on. The Creed's and Roddy beefed, and Strong made a match for the Bash, the Creed's against Strong, and Damon Kemp for the NXT Tag Team titles. Then Trick and Carmelo found out that Waller swerved him into a title match against uh, him at the Bash, and that was okay with them. They kind of made some jokes about him not being as trustworthy as they thought, and even though they have slapped that match together, I mean... It's Carmelo Hayes and it's Grayson Waller. It's it, it's hard for me to believe that it's not going to be a really fun, wild, high-flying match. So I'm all good with that. It's then time for a member of the WWE medical team to come out to speak about Alba Fire's condition after getting hit with a bat last week by Lash Legend. When Lash comes in and literally kicks this guy out of the shot, she's so tall and he's so short, I guess, that when she does, it's his her heel kicking his shoulder, and he, he goes flying out of the shot. She says uh, that she'll never see Alba Fire again. I just don't want to see any more matches between the two, but I have a feeling that we will. Zion, Quinn, and Sanga then came brawling to the ring. Referees pulled them apart. Show went to break. When they came back... Sanga basically beat the hell out of Zion Quinn. It was really a great way to put over Sanga. Beats him with a, a big choke slam, and it's like, oh, man, what did Zion Quinn do? We'll find out a little bit later on as he comes back and gets in the mix. We then got a dream sequence of Wendy Chu being haunted by the dreams and the words of Tiffany Stratton being mean to her. But then she had happy thoughts take over, and we got a montage of times that she's been really happy or has gotten to Tiffany and she says it's simple. I get under your skin, I go for the pin, and then I win. Tiffany Stratton and Wendy Chu next week, Great American Bash. Nikita Lyons defeated Mandy Rose by DQ, and Toxic Attraction jumped in after 100 spin kicks by Lyons. Cora and Roxanne ran down to help Lyons clear the ring. It wasn't good. It really wasn't. It, was, it, was, it wasn't good. And Nikita Lyons uh, right now isn't that person. And I don't know if Mandy Rose is ever going to be. No offense. But I just, no, watching that, it was no fun. Solo Co talking to Apollo Crews in the back. This basically led to Zion Quinn butting in. And uh, it looks like Zion Quinn and Apollo Crews will be a match coming up, if not this coming week. Uh, in the next couple of weeks, J.D. McDonough, the former Jordan Devlin, is still driving and still talking. Says he's going to be the ace no matter where he goes. He is apparently going to debut next week. And then it was the main event between Braun Breaker and Cameron Grimes, a face-to-face -face with Wade Barrett hosting. And I thought this was, was pretty good with those two going back and forth. Really came down to Cameron Grimes saying, you know what, if you lose this belt, you could go up to the main roster. You could be on SummerSlam. I'm putting all my chips in. I got nothing to lose here. They got into it. He actually threw Braun Breaker into the buckle a couple times, breaking the rim, hurting his shoulder, and giving himself a little bit more of a chance leading in to the Great American Bash. We'll be back to put a bow on things after the break. Wrestling Observer Live. Oh, Lordy, Mike Sempervivi back on the show, Wrestling Observer Live. This one was a struggle. You know what I'm saying? This was, this was, this was a battle. Talking with producer Dom during the break. Even he said it. You're hurting. You're limping. You're dying right now. It's all right, though. There's always tomorrow. There's always a tomorrow here at Wrestling Observer Live. We are here with you every single day, seven days a week. Andrew Zarian on Sunday, 6 p.m. Big Jim Valley, Saturdays, 1 p.m. Eastern Time. Brian and I here every single day, Monday through Friday, 3 p.m. Eastern Time. The big boss man will be back tomorrow. He'll be back next week, too, to, to talk about NXT Great American Bash. And I should, before we go, run down the actual lineup for that, since I just did a whole segment talking about what happened on it. Braun Breaker, Cameron Grimes, NXT Championship. Toxic Attraction against Roxanne Perez and Cora Jade for the Women's Tag Team Championship. Carmelo Hayes and Grayson Waller for the North American Championship. Again, how is that not going to be great? NXT Tag Team Championship. Look, Creed Brothers, Damon Kemp just started off. They are big, just 
again, puppies with big paws right now, throwing guys around, throwing each other around. This match with Roderick Strong, I think, could be really fun. It won't be pretty at times, but I think could be a real banger. So I'm looking forward to that. And, and frankly, Diamond Mine splitting up and feuding with each other because I think that could be great. I love Tiffany Stratton. I love the gimmick. Uh, her and Wendy Chu, I bet you the match will probably be okay. There's going to be all sorts of gimmicks and all that sorts of nonsense. So if you want to be bitter about it, just don't watch it. Trick Williams and Wesley. We'll see where Trick Williams is at because I know Wesley is going to be really good. They've been pushing him. This is his shot. Big breakout performance here. He needs a big singles win. I think his promos have been good. All the features they've been doing on him. Let's get him a big victory here at the very least. Hopefully he has a big performance. I'm going to have a big performance tomorrow. I promise. <laughs> Thank you, Producer John. Thank you, Producer Dom. Thank you all out there for listening. We shall talk to you again after a while.